Locked on Spartans family, locked on Terps family. We are coming together as one big, happy Big Ten family. Hey, what's up? It's Matt Sheehan, host of Locked on Spartans. Over there, it's Trey Moore, locked on Terps host. 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on NBC, national televised audience. Trey, your Terps are coming to visit our Spartans. And before we get into the whole game here, how are you doing so far this season? I mean, you can't be too bad. You guys are looking pretty good on the field so far. Yeah, we're looking pretty good right now. We're 3-0 and going into the Big Ten play. We haven't played the stiffest competition yet. We've played Towson, Charlotte, and we did play Virginia last week, an ACC opponent, but Virginia's team isn't the best this year. But overall, we, we've played pretty well. I'm excited where the team is. One thing I would say is slow starts. We've gone down 14-0 two weeks in a row. But overall, we're 3-0, and and that's exactly what we wanted to be coming out of these three non-conference games. And 3-0 and is 3-0 and going into a Big Ten play. There we go. And I have to thank your Terps because they were one of my five best bets last week. They're minus, I think it was 14 and a half or 16 and a half, whatever it was against Virginia. They yeah, took care of it. No problem after. Yeah. See, after, after that slow start, I, who who even cared? They, they barnstormed to what, like a 42 to 0 finish. It was a, a decisive win against a eh, Virginia team. So with that said, though, like it, it has been a three and no start for Maryland, which is what you want in football. But it hasn't been against the stiffest competition. Are you feeling good? about your Terrapins after three games right now, or what is the vibe over there? Yeah, I just actually recorded my episode where on Wednesday, and I said, I feel like we're in a perfect spot right now, offensive okay. and defensively. I think some of the question marks in terms of the run game have gotten figured out um, in terms of stopping the run. Um, I love where Talia is at. He had two interceptions against Charlotte, which was a little bit, um, concerning a little bit, um, especially because we expect him to not make some of those reads that he did make against Charlotte. But overall, he's played really well against Virginia, had a couple of huge plays down the field. But right now, in terms of where the team's at, I think we're in a really good spot. But let me know how what you think about the Michigan State team right now, where you guys are at. I was, I was afraid you're going to turn the tables and ask me how we're doing. Uh, Trey, we're doing horrible over here. Uh, <laughs> uh, our head coach is gone, uh, embattled in scandal. But, look, it did not go well whatsoever last week against Washington, a top-10 team, and every bit of a top-10 team in the country. Uh, things started off great against Central, against Richmond. But then again, it's a – not that great of a central team and a pretty lousy Richmond team. I mean, even for FCS standards, they aren't that great of a team. So he took care of them. And then you get a top or a top 10 team coming into town. Your Honor, okay, this is going to be the good test to see how it's going to go. It did not go well in Seattle last year against Washington. Where have we grown this year, despite the weird week that Michigan State had? Trey, it 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 did it didn't go well at all, my man. Uh, it was forty-one to seven, and any state fan that watched that game on Peacock, they know that it wasn't even that close. Uh, Washington could have won that game, probably seventy-nine to zero, if they really wanted to put the pedal to the metal. But Kalen DeBoer, I don't know if it was an early gift for uh, hey, we're coming into the Big Ten, we want to be on good terms. I don't know if he gave us a gift by benching Michael Penix with five minutes to go in the third quarter, but that that could have been a lot messier. So we turn the page. It's a normal er week, I guess you could call it, because we are in day 11 of the Mel Tucker saga. Maybe it's a little more normal week for the players, the coaches, but still at the end of the day, we did see a lot of the mistakes happen last weekend that we have seen the last year, if not two years in some instances. So how are things going on in East Lansing, Trey? That's very nice of you to ask, but it's it's 47 days till basketball season as far as i'm concerned but hey that's not going to stop us from talking about football man <laughs> it's uh oh yeah um it, it's fine everything's fine yeah yeah no i will i did i watched the michigan state game i went back last night and oh. watched it but i i did watch it live i mean i had on like all the games but i i have a peacock account i was tuned in and i watched Penix. Junior, who's supposed to be the top quarterback in the draft. I wanted to see how he looked. I wanted to see yeah. how Michigan State looked, obviously going into the game against Michigan State. And I saw – um, correct me if I'm wrong, but he had like three over 300 yards in the first half. Uh, I, I think the number was 375. Not that that number's burned into my memory already, but, yeah. It, and, it, and it looks like every bit of 375. It's, and it's not just him, too. It's an incredible receiver. So I'm yeah. trying to – separate like okay we have an nfl quarterback he has at least two nfl receivers if not three you know what maybe that kind of a game was to be expected but i don't know man at the end of the day they gave up over 700 yards and our offense couldn't do anything so 
the thing I come back to is I don't care how weird of a week it was for Michigan State. I don't care how good of a team Washington is. Boise State and Tulsa gave Washington a harder battle than Michigan State did on their home turf. Like that, that that's gotta change quick. And we got a Terrapin team that is like looking good. And this has been kind of a theme here under Mike Loxley because for the better part of a decade or two decades, or God, I mean, for a while, Maryland football has never been really thought of, but Oh, snap, you you guys are actually good. What are the goals for your team this year? Like, at the end of the year, when you look back and you look at everything, what is going to call the season a success, in your opinion? I think adding another win onto the team every single year in the last couple of years, we've added a win in Coach Loxley's era. Um, Two years ago, we had seven wins, and then we went up to eight wins. And then I'm saying if we go to nine wins now, I think that's kind of where we want to be as a program. But I think eight wins is also okay. I think challenging in Ohio State, challenging a Penn State, challenging in Michigan, which we did a little bit last year. We got spanked by Penn State last year. But in terms of the Ohio State and Michigan game, both of those games are close. So challenging all three of those games, I'm not sure if we're in the position yet to win one. But if we steal one of those Mm -hmm. games, that could be great. But I think getting to nine wins is going to be challenging, but I think it's something that we can really do. And I think one thing that a lot of the Terps community has talked about is being 5-0 and going into the Ohio State game. So just beating your Spartans this week is huge and then going into Indiana next week. But I think that this is a challenging week for us I going on the road, especially after what happened in the Washington game. You guys are going to be ready to rebound. And yeah. I know that you just lost your coach and Tucker. How has that overall been going? What is that like? Um, have they gotten time to adjust? How how overall has that looked for you guys? Yeah, it, it's 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 a weird question because he wasn't on the sideline. Or not a weird question, but it's a weird answer, I should say, because he wasn't on the sideline on Saturday, but it still just seemed like a, a Mel Tucker team, like it, just like kind of undisciplined personnel penalties. And of course that's not just a melting that also ladders down to his assistant coaches, like our special teams coordinator sending 12 people out to the punt unit. Like, okay. That's great. We're in year four of doing this. I, I'm going to save the rambling. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it showed a lot of what we found last year under Mel Tucker, just like unfocused, undisciplined, unprepared. And so we're going to see how much, these assistant coaches can actually help this week because they're supposed to be the adults in the room. I know that last week it did not go great and the players didn't play necessarily outstanding, but in such a odd topsy turvy week like that, you got to look at the adults in the room, your coordinators, your assistant coaches. So this is where they're going to make their medal here coming up because if, if you want to still go bowling this year and boy, this is going to be an important game for Michigan state moving forward. There are not a lot of other quote, winnable games moving forward after this. And even this one, Michigan State's a six and a half point underdog. I don't even know how winnable this game is, but still moving forward. Whew, I, th- this is an important one. You do want to get out of this four game home stretch, at least three and one. I've been saying that all off season. And I still think that right now, despite everything going on, you have to get out of here three and one, because it is a blessing to start with four straight home games to start your year. Got to take advantage of it. And it's easier said than done, especially with everything going on. But man, it's uh, we're we're gonna see how how much these coordinators want this season to continue here, because <laughs> oh boy, God, last week's game plan was a disaster. Try a disaster. I'm almost over it. I'm almost over it. You, you can tell. <sighs> no, it it takes time. It takes time to get over that type of thing. But I'm thinking the six point five points might be a little bit. It, it seemed like a lot to me when I looked at it um, yeah. this morning. It seems like a lot for us to be that much favorites on the road against a Michigan State team. I mean, this is still a Michigan State. It's a pretty big brand, Big Ten brand. And I was a little bit surprised, even with the struggles that you guys had against Washington last week. I I was like, that seems like a lot of points still. And I don't want Maryland to get overconfident because I think this game is going to be close, to be honest. I would like Maryland to get overconfident, actually. I I think I'm going to drive down to Maryland and tape on their lockers. Like, hey, you guys are supposed to win by a touchdown. Don't even try this week. I'm going to do anything I can in my power here. Uh, Trey, let's get into the nitty-gritty here. Next segment, throw me in the hot seat, ask about Michigan State. And then the segment after that, I will throw you in the hot seat, ask about your turfs. But first, need to talk to people's ear off about Jace Medical. That is right, Jace Medical. They are changing the game with their life-saving antibiotics. Thanks to the Jace case. 
Now, what on earth am I talking about when I say the Jace case? It is very simple. They deliver five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use straight to your house. And no, you don't just have to stash it in your house. Of course, you could keep it in your car, your RV, your boat, or if you're going to be traveling abroad, throw that in your luggage. Don't worry about having to go visit a doctor in emergency situations. Just take the convenience of the Jace case. It is so easy. Get ongoing care from their physicians on any treatment related questions as well. It is doctor created, doctor recommended, and they just don't want you to be caught unprepared, especially in these uncertain times. So save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical plus an additional $20 off by using code locked on. That's all one word locked on at checkout at jacemedical.com. That is J A S E medical.com promo code locked on. Again, go ahead and get your Jace case at jacemedical.com. All right. It's hot seat time. Time to grill me about my Spartans. I'm going to try to be a little more upbeat here because there, there are some talented units on this team. I mean, it's just, we didn't really see them last weekend. So Trey, what do you got for me, my man? What is going on with the quarterback situation? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm was, sorry. Because wasn't he um the he played really well two weeks ago, and then last week yeah. it wasn't his best performance. So overall, what what should we expect? What should the Maryland fans expect from? Him? Fantastic question because you are bang on. Two weeks ago against Richmond, it was a slow start for Noah Kim, and he also had a slow start against Central Michigan, but against the Chips, bounce back against Richmond. Program record 15 straight completions out of Noah Kim. He wins Big Ten Player of the Week. We're starting to feel good about the quarterback situation. And then he got rocked pretty early on against Washington. Now, I don't know if he got hurt a little bit in that hit. I don't know if he just got a little shook and that kind of wavered his confidence. But he sailed a few throws that, well, he had open receivers. And that's when the game was still kind of somewhat barely in reach. And it just kind of went to the wayside by the end of the fourth quarter. Backup quarterback, Caden Hauser, comes in, and he leads the Spartans on a pretty nice touchdown drive. Now, I will say it was against Washington's backups. I'm not going to get ahead of my skis here. But it does bring back to the conversation, hey, is there a quarterback battle? Because that was the biggest storyline going into the season. It was it seemed apparent from all the sources that you've heard from or even the inside sources that you heard from off the record that it was neck and neck in the quarterback battle. But, yeah, Noah Kim had the, the, the driver's wheel. The first three weeks, and I think it's going to still say the same. I'm gonna. That's that's my guess is that he's still going to be the starting quarterback. He is still going to get the bulk of the snaps here, and he's going to get a longer leash than maybe a lot of people think. But yeah, that was tough because Washington is an incredible team for what they do on offense. They just have a solid defense, and MSU couldn't get a single thing going in the pass game in the run game. But yeah, it was it was an underwhelming game from Noah Kim. But hey, I. Hopefully we could get a bounce back performance here. I just, I just wonder because Maryland, you guys got a pretty good defense, man. I so that's, yeah. The, the quarterback situation, um, it seemed clear after two weeks. It, it is a little murkier now, though. Trey, not not great, not great. No, yeah, I understand that. What's what's the situation with you guys' running back room? I know you guys use a couple of different guys, but what, what is in what's going on in there in the running back room? Should I be worried about the run game for Michigan State? You would you would really hope. I I really thought that this would be a thing that other teams would have to be worried about. But Trey, everyone's dead. Um, we have our starting running back, Nathan Carter. He's great. I like him a lot. He's doing fantastic work so far. The numbers don't really say that last week, but he's also not getting a lot of help from the offensive line, in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of other football knowers as well. What is not helping Michigan State here is that the backup running back, Jalen Berger, he's hurt. He got hurt, I believe, in the Richmond game, and uh, Coach Harlan or acting head Coach Harlan Barnett said he's maybe a week away. They're going to try to give it a go this weekend, but it's not looking likely. And then, okay, well, who's the backups backup? It's Jaron Mangum, transferred from South Florida, has yet to play this season. He gave it a go in warmups against Richmond, and I think he re-aggravated his injury actually. So we're uh, we're two backup running backs out, and so now we're at our. Fourth running back as our backup is Jordan Simmons. He's been here for a while. There's a reason he's been here for a while and is our fourth string running back, but you never know. Any given Saturday, I guess you could have a big game. But, yeah, it's we are thin on bodies behind Nathan Carter and just not getting a lot of help from the offensive line as well, which is really disheartening because this was supposed to be a unit and a strength of this team moving forward. The, the run game was supposed to be the bell cow. For MSU and after your first serious opponent in Washington – 
seems like we are very far from that being the case. So yeah, that's that's the run game here. God, I'm not doing a good job being an upbeat, am I? Huh? <laughs> I'm, really, I'm, re- I'm really not. I'm, I'm sorry to all the state fans out there, but look, I just got to talk about what I'm seeing last week against your first Power 5 opponent, and um, that's what we got. That's what we got. What about the pass defense? Giving up all those yards last week, is yeah. that something that we should expect Maryland's offense to be able to take advantage of, or is that a little bit of a fluke? What's going on with the secondary cornerback room <laughs> and getting pass rush over on the defense? Yeah, I think all state fans are going to agree with me here that I, I don't know if you can call it a fluke, especially with what's happened the last few years. Even that 11-win season that we had with Kenneth Walker on the team, our, our past defense was still terrible back then. Um, and so I don't know if we can call it a fluke if this is what would it be, the third year in a row that we are seeing it. And I'm not going to just shred the secondary apart because there were some plays last week where our, our guys were draped in coverage. Like, they played as good of coverage as possible – you just ran into a first, if not second round quarterback, and then a first, if not round, you know, receiver. Like sometimes that just happens. What is not helping the secondary though, is that there was a supreme lack of pass rush last week. And that is again, just like we talked about the run game for offense, how that was supposed to be a strength, the pass rush in front six or seven, depending on how you look at it, was supposed to be a strength for Michigan state. Michael Penix, I don't even think he saw the whites of any defensive lineman's eyes the entire game. Like, no one no one got close to him the entire game. So, as if it isn't hard enough going against an NFL quarterback, NFL receivers, you're giving him what seemed like a half hour in every pocket to throw the ball. So, it, it was a complete breakdown just top to bottom. And it's, it's, it's not like Washington's offensive line is like all world. They are probably a notch above average, yes. But, man, I was really hopeful for something in the pass rush game, and we just did not get it. So um, am I am I a little afraid that, that Tua 2.0 can have a field day against Michigan State this Saturday? Yeah, yeah, Trey. That's why I'm not sleeping at all this week. It's, <laughs> I, I just, I'm just not – I'm just not, not, not hopeful. Not hopeful. <sighs> Give me um one X factor on the offensive or defense side of the ball or both that maybe a guy that even Michigan State fans aren't really looking out for that can maybe change the course of the game. Yeah, we're going to go with the tight end position here. This is an X factor where if we're not going to see it by game four, I really do wonder if we are going to see it ever this season. And it's not to say he's had a bad season. It's, it's been a solid season for Malik Carr. I should probably say the kid's name before I go any further. Malik Carr, six foot seven tight end, uh, former four star athlete, uh, basketball player, football player. So, a really athletic guy. And he has been solid this year, but with what Michigan State needs in the passing game, that big body target. I, I was expecting a little more from him. Now, is that a him problem? You could point to some things in the central game where, okay, we are jogging out of a route, or is it just that he isn't getting schemed to have the ball in his hands? You can maybe point to that last game against Washington, but yeah, I think Malik Carr is due for a quote unquote breakout game here pretty soon. Now, can it be against Maryland? I, I sure hope so, because if we are leaving the month of September, and he has yet to have a game where you look at the box score and you're like, oh, my God, or you're looking at the game film and you're like, whew, that's a, that's a day two draft pick. Like, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to see it, quite frankly, this season because I, time is of the essence and there is every single reason for him to be a strength of this team. So I'm going to go with Malik Carr for, for the offense here. Yeah, no question. No Got question. You. Um, yeah. what's the defensive line like? I know you said that that the pass rush yeah. has struggled, but is there any one that has player that has underperformed significantly that should play be playing a little bit better? I so I don't know if it's just one player because we do have some solid talent on this defensive line. I'll leave you with, with a little bit of optimism here. Like Simeon Barrow and Derek Harmon on the inside. Fine players, fantastic players. There, there are some programs out there that were trying to pull Simi Barrow away from Michigan State, and for good reason. I mean, this, this guy is built like the Incredible Hulk. I mean, just absolutely shredded and plays like that as well. So if I have to point to something, it, it, it's got to be the defensive end position here. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give him one more game before I really, really, really start pulling every single alarm bell in here. But, man, it's it, it leaves a lot to be desired from the, the end position here. And I know it's kind of been – a carousel of sorts early on in the season. But yeah, I, if, if there's anyone underperforming, it, it would be the ends based on last game because I feel pretty good about what Michigan State has in the middle between Harmon, Barrow, uh, Maverick Hansen is another uh, backup guy that has played really well lately too. So yeah, it's uh, it, this is going to be a great litmus test for us Michigan State fans of, all right, what is what is this defensive line truly? Like, what, what do we got here? <laughs> yeah. 
No, yeah, those those all make total sense. But do you have any questions about Maryland overall? And oh, do, do I have questions? I sure do. But first, Trey, you know we got to pay the bills here at Locked On. It's time to talk about Fan Duel Sportsbook. Just like me and Trey have referenced a few times here, six and a half points. That's how much Michigan State is underdogs at home. If you're feeling spicy about our Spartans or over there. Down in Maryland, if you're feeling great about your Terps, go get in on the action at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And also, hey, let's say that college football isn't your only cup of tea here. Well, snap into the action this NFL season with FanDuel. Again, it's America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get two hundred dollars in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a five dollar bet that's two hundred dollars in bonus bets win or lose and if you're thinking about joining FanDuel there is no better time to get in on the action the app is so easy to use and there's a wide range of things you can bet on like spreads player props over unders or my favorite the same game parlays so visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and kick off the NFL season it's FanDuel official partner of the NFL Trey why Give me some. You know what? Here, we're gonna put you on the hot seat. I, I did a bad job of being optimistic about this game. What's what's not going well with Maryland? And I know that's a very bizarre question. You guys are three and zero. You guys have paced your competition. But when you're watching these games, what's something you're like, huh? This could come to bite us once we play like a semi-serious team here. Number one, slow starts. I talked about a little bit before. That is the biggest thing. Going for, going down 14-0 to Virginia, going down 14-0 to Charlotte. That's the number one thing that absolutely cannot happen. And the root of those slow starts has been on both sides of the ball. But the biggest thing, our defense has played really well, but they've given up two big plays, and it's the reason that we've kind of gone off to those slow starts. And it's been the same player, Jaquan Shepard, a transfer from Cincinnati, who we expected to be a really good starting corner, who has played well, but – in the Charlotte game, he tried to jump a route on a guy that wasn't his on an out route, and his guy was streaking down the field for an easy over 50-yard touchdown. And then against Virginia, Virginia was watching film. They knew what to do. They ran a flea flicker against us. Jaquan Shepard tries to come up and stop the running back, and boom, before you know it, his guy's down the sideline for an over 50-yard touchdown again. So those are the two biggest things. I'd say the big plays that we've given up on defense and the slow starts, that can really come back to bite us. I've said that. If we start slow against a Michigan State on the road, we are not – we probably won't be able to come back. We probably won't be able to win. I mean, I won't count it out, but I – it, sure. The chances are going to go down. Um, Talia interceptions also, two against Charlotte, is concerning. There's stinker games where um, Talia just doesn't play well. He has a couple of them every single year. Last year he had two where it was like under 50% throwing the ball, and he had, he throws interceptions. So there's those are the three things that I look out for that could come back to bite us against a Michigan State team on the road. And Maryland is known for their offense under Mike Loxley, of course. Uh, how are you guys different than last year? Because it's been a solid offense because, I mean, Talia has been there for 15 years now. I mean, you, you get what you get with Maryland. But what has been different from last year compared to this year, for better or for worse for, for you guys? Yeah, I mean, starting with the offensive line, that's another concern. But they've, they've picked it up a little bit. But we replaced four starters on the offensive line coming from last year on to this year. So – DJ Glaze was our only returner. He's going to be an NFL player, and he's a really good player. But in terms of four, the other four spots on the offensive line, all new players, and we're still trying to figure it out on the offensive line. We don't really have our starting five yet. We're still rotating guys in and out. So that's one thing that's going to be – um, a big change from last year. The wide receiver room is almost completely different in terms of okay. we have a bunch of guys in the NFL now, whether it's Copeland, Rakeem Jarrett, or Dante Demas are all in NFL are all in the NFL and NFL camps on practice squads, Rakeem Jarrett's on the Buccaneers team. And now we have new guys like Octavian Smith has to step up, but we have two transfers to look out for, Caden Prather and Tyree Chambers that are really good players. Caden Prather, 6'4", big play threat. Tyree Chambers can do it all. He's He moves the chains on third down. But Jason Jones, third down slot player, was here. Um, has been here for a while now, really good player in the wide receiver room. But players have to step up, but those two transfers are two guys that you have to look out for. And then the defensive line, we have almost all new starters, but they've played pretty well overall. We had Jordan Phillips transfer from Tennessee, big dude. 
three over 300 pounds, his legs, tree trunks, huge guy, but really good player stopping the run. And then Tommy King Basote was a four star who hasn't had to play a ton yet because we've had bodies in that defensive line group. But and he's been part of the rotation, but this year he's now a starter. So overall, that's kind of where we see it. And then also in the cornerback room with Deontay Banks and Jacorian Bennett, both on NFL teams. Deontay Banks, of course, was the first round pick. So there is spots that we have that are gone from last year, but overall, people have come in and replaced, and Coach Loxley's done a good job in the transfer portal overall with replacing yeah. that and improving in those areas. I'm thrilled to not see Raheem Jarrett anymore. That that man scared me yeah. a lot. A uh, very very talented player. But so with that said, like skill position player on offense, I should absolutely be terrified of now that Raheem Jarrett has left that hole for you guys. Who who's going to give me the willies this Saturday? Yeah, I mean, I'd say in the wide receiver room, I would say probably Jay Sean Jones. Like I talked okay. about him, who's now a grad student. He's a guy that had ninety. Um, five yards last week against Virginia had a big shot to Talia, but I think the most um, scary guy probably is actually the tight end Corey Deitches. He's like six two. He's kind of that in between between a wide receiver and tight end spot, and he's fast. He's explosive, and he kind of he's too fast for linebackers to cover, but he's in too big for cornerback. So he's a really scary player in Towson against the Towson Tigers in our first game of the year, which isn't stiff competition, but he had over a hundred yards receiving. And then also Roman Hem being the backfield actually just got ranked second on Mel Kuyper's board for running backs, which was pretty wow. um, impressive for Roman Hemby. So he's probably number one. Everyone's it all starts with Roman Hemby, but those are three guys that are definitely scary. I would say in the skilled spots. Who should keep me up tonight uh, as far as the, the defense goes? Where's where's the strength line that? Because you guys, I, I I believe, return a good amount in the secondary in the pass game. But yeah. what, where is it at with, with the defense for you guys? Yeah, number one, I'd say the secondary. I've talked about it on the Locked on Terps a lot that I think we have one of the best secondary units in the Big Ten with – Tarheeb Still, who had two interceptions last week. He's a really good player. And then Jaquan Shepard on the other side, who's given up the big plays. But I'm almost happy he's done that early on in the season because sure. yeah. I think now it's going to be fixed. Coaching staff is going to be on that. We're going to They're going to watch film like everyone knows he's got to fix that, and it won't happen anymore, and we were still able to win the games. So those are two players. And then our safety duo – Bo Braid is going to be an NFL player, really good player, Bo Braid, so look out for him. I'm actually uncertain of his status for the game because he was out last week, but I think he's supposed to play this week against Michigan State. And then Dante Trader, okay. another um, really good player in the back end and safety group. So overall, the secondary is really good, but our best defensive player, probably our most talented guy who's going to be an NFL player, but he's only a true sophomore Um is Jason Barham, the linebacker, do it all. I think he's actually our best edge rusher, too. So he kind of is our all-around, I would say, most important player on that defense. Jason Barham, look out for him um, in at linebacker position. He'll also rush off the edge. Um, had two sacks two weeks ago against Charlotte, so watch out for Jason Barham. Gotcha. And what talking head show would this be if we just didn't do predictions right now? Do you Do you have a prediction? For the Saturday I, to, to put I do. Here. I do. All right. I think Michigan State covers the spread. I think it's going to be 23-27, okay. but I think Michigan State covers the spread in a Terps win. What I'm going to give State fans – well, I'm going to give State fans a, a, a second to turn this off because I, I don't think they want to hear my predictions, so I'm just going to – okay. Okay, all right, so here's my prediction. I think that's enough time for them. Uh, Maryland 32, MSU 20 is, is what I have written down here. Uh, it, it's it's very hard, if not impossible, for me to find any optimism from this team, not just from what happened last week in this actual stadium against Washington, but also it, it's just been a weird cloud over MSU the last week and a half. And then if you just want to go back the last few years, I mean, we saw, like I've said earlier in the show, we've seen a lot of the mistakes last weekend that we've seen just the last few years here. I don't know if I could trust anyone on that staff or anyone in the room to change all those mistakes just like that overnight. But, hey, I would be jazzed to be wrong. I would be over the absolute moon to see Michigan State win this game because, hey, if we want to crawl to six wins, make a bowl game, this one is a big one here. I just don't see it, though. 32, 20 Terps, and a lot of sadness on Saturday. So, yeah, But, hey, regardless – 
Yeah, hey, whatever happens, you can count on me. You can count on Trey. Break everything down on our respective shows. You know what I do, Locked on Spartans. You know what Trey does, Locked on Turfs. Trey, this was awesome, man. Thanks a lot for chatting. This is and, awesome, uh, yeah. Oh, dude, this is great. Thanks for thanks great. for having me on. Thanks for doing this. It was an awesome episode. Hey. And thanks for having me on your show. That's the beauty of crossovers, man. <laughs> Two birds with one stone, uh, gang. So until next time, enjoy your weekend. Let's Let's do it, guys. Come on now. Let's go.